So, Marsha, um, thank you so much for doing this interview. Um, could you start by helping people understand um, how self-directed support has developed in New Zealand um, and yeah, when, it, when the journey began and how far along that journey do you think you are at the moment? Sure. Um, really, um, self-direction in New Zealand probably started in the early, uh, late 1999, well, late 1999, 2000. Um, uh, and, and basically, uh, what was happening in New Zealand was it was running under the radar. So we have a system where disabled people get assessed by an organization that's an agent of the government and they are gatekeepers for the money. They're called the Needs Assessment and Service Coordination Organizations. And there's about 15 of them around the country. Um, that, and it started just in disability and it's, and it's largely still just in disability. But in the early 2000s, um, people were increasingly dissatisfied with traditional methods of support and traditional um, providers and primarily um, this was the under 65 uh, group with, with uh, people with disabilities so lots of mums and dads and families and particularly those mother bears who uh, wanted to better for their children um, and basically they would go to the NASC organization and say I can do this a lot better give me the money and I can do it better and those were those really uh, vocal and strong advocates for their children and it was easier for the NASCs just to say okay well here's the money you go and do it but shh, don't tell anyone you know um, and so that was that was happening increasingly across the country and the funding agency which is the Ministry of Health got wind of that uh, that trend and it was growing and growing and growing because it was easier for the NASCs to give these parents the money and for them to do it quietly than it was for them to deal with all of the complaints around the providers. So that, that group grew and in 2004, the ministry decided that they needed to get a handle on what was happening with that group. It was called, at the time it was called discretionary funding. So there was a lot of people using discretionary funding. Um, and so in 2004, the ministry decided that um, Around the world, there were, there were uh, programs and models popping up called individualized funding or self uh, personal budgets or whatever, just in little pockets. So 2004, they decided that perhaps they would run a, uh, a pilot project and test it in New Zealand. So they ran a tender for that. And there were um, four organizations that responded to the tender, but none of them could deliver the whole scope of what the Ministry of Health was looking for. Um, so basically the Ministry of Health came back to those four organizations and said, why don't you collaborate? So that's what they did. And they established an organization called Manawa Nui in Charge, which is what I run today. But that was the single organization at the time that was uh, permitted to run an individualized funding uh, program. So that ticked along for about four years. And then in 2008, uh, they decided that perhaps they should review that pilot because as you know, pilot programs are like that, particularly in government departments, they run, they run and nobody kind of pays any attention, particularly if they're going well, which this was. Um, and, but it was very restricted. There was, there was 125 people on it. Um, and then it grew to about 200. And so in 2008, there was about 200 people on this pilot program and so they ran a, a, an evaluation at that point in time and it, no surprise to anyone they had 99 percent of people who absolutely loved it and said please please don't take it away because we we don't want anything different and then the one percent that that didn't absolutely love it their primary complaint was that it was too administratively heavy so there was a lot of paperwork um, you know and they said it's very hard to administer um, you know we would like it well, we don't want to lose it but we would like it better if it was easier to do then that same year we had a very friendly minister called Teriana Teria who was the minister for disability issues 
and she ran a select committee process, which is a review, a government review, of all of the disability services and the quality of, of services delivered to pe disabled people in New Zealand. And that really made the difference uh, in terms of progress for self-direction in New Zealand because that report, that select committee report came back and it said, we want more individualized funding and we want it yesterday. So she could see the value that it was delivering to people and she could see the outcomes. And also because she was Maori, she recognized that this was very culturally appropriate because it was defined by the people who, who were using it, which is the nature of self-direction, of course. So um, that gave the program skates, really. Um, it gave it the, it gave, uh, I was at the Ministry of Health at the time, and it gave us the chance to expand it out quickly across the nation. So it was, there was really just little pockets of it happening under the pilot project. And that particular report allowed us to expand it out across the nation. So they, they ran another process to add um, what they're, they're called individualized funding hosts, which is what Manawanui is. And I can talk about that later. Um, but but the, the, it was called an expression of interest. And we collected a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of providers who we thought could act as a host for uh, people who wanted to use individualized funding. Um, and that just grew and grew and grew. And in 2011, when um, I moved from the Ministry of Health to Manawanui at that point in time, there was 700 people on the program then. And now uh, we have 4,000 just with Manawanui and probably 5,000 across the nation. That's, that that 5,000 is a guess, but um, there's a lot. And it continues to grow. You know, we grow at about between 10 and 15% each year uh, in terms of the amount of people that are taking it up. So it's very, very popular. And even when people uh, use, even when people use the program and find themselves struggling with either budget management or being an employer or any of the uh, administrative functions, they still don't want to go back to the way that they had to function before where they had a traditional home care provider who may or may not turn up. You had a different, different um, support worker each day. Quality is, you know, um, not consistent and, um, and, and a continual string of frustrations from, from people. They, even when people find individualized funding as it, as it exists in New Zealand difficult, they still don't want to go back. So it's, it, it has been, very successful in terms of its growth. And now um, we're moving to, because of that success of individualized funding, um, the government has committed to what they're calling system transformation. And what they mean by that is that they, they would like individualized funding to become a default position instead of just that one little choice that you could take if you were capable of managing a budget. So it started out uh, with a really restrictive little group that were eligible. Uh, then, then as the outcomes were really obvious in terms of quality and people's lives just changed immensely because all of a sudden they could get out and get jobs and participate in the community and live, live an ordinary life like we all have the choice to do every day. Um, but that, that the success of individualized funding just illustrated uh, how good a self-directed approach is for people. And now the government has committed to system transformation where self-direction is seen as a default position. That's, I mean, that's great progress in terms of a commitment to it. The, the big challenges are how to implement that. Um, and I guess what I can say about that evolution is that in 2012, uh, they, they kind of did it in stages, um, and the stages were various demonstration projects. So in 2012, they introduced what was called uh, enhanced individualized funding, and that was in a particular geographic area in New Zealand called the Bay of Plenty. So it was very limited uh, geographically, and, and it didn't go very well because the Ministry of Health 
um, became very nervous about what people may or may not purchase using their disability support funding. So they kept intervening and they kept interfering and asking for more evidence for why that particular purchase was made or, or whatever. And that was about, the, the reason that that happened was that the officials at the ministry changed. And so their commitment to it changed. And, and I think that, yeah, that's a, that's a risk. Um, so they started with enhanced individualized funding in the Bay of Plenty. Then, then there was a group that got together and wrote a paper to cabinet, to the government, um, called Enabling Good Lives. And that particular paper was based on eight principles. So I'm not going to be able to recite them all, but it was, it's, it's um, self-determination, mainstream first, um, mana enhancing, relationship building. Uh, what am I on now? Number five. <laughs> um, easy to use, uh, ordinary life outcomes, person-centered, and beginning early. Got them all. Um, so those particular, those eight principles underpinned two more demonstration projects. One in Christchurch, so not, again, geographically limited. Um, uh, and that also had target groups. So it was people, young people leaving school were eligible for that particular program. And that was used to demonstrate uh, the, you know, to test and demonstrate how self-direction and or individualized funding could be um, broadened in terms of the scope and, and scaled. Um, and then there was a second one that happened in the Waikato, which is in central New Zealand. Uh, again, geographically limited, and there was three target groups there. Uh, young people, Maori, and uh, people who didn't have access, who didn't otherwise have access, I, I think. I can't remember the exact groups. Anyway, um, all of those demonstration projects, Enhanced Individualized Funding and the two Enabling Good Lives programs, also had uh, a secondary and complementary component uh, that was loosely based around local area coordination. So the idea was that a local area coordinator um, or some iteration of that, some version of that, uh, would connect the person to their community first and natural supports on the basis that that would reduce the amount of funded formal supports that that person would need. So all of them had that component. And now, because they, what they have done is looked at all of those demonstration projects and thought, we can, we've learned from that, we've learned from that, and we've learned from that. Let's uh, get some convergence here, and we'll do another one, <laughs> another demonstration project in the Manoa too, which is also central uh, North Island of New Zealand. And that's, but that's called Mana Faikaha, and that one is aimed at saying, if we were to give people complete flexibility with their budget and allow them to determine what their life should look like um, that's what we want to achieve ultimately so they're taking um, the concept of individualized funding expanding it out to a, a much more self-directed and person-centered approach based on those principles that I just went through and saying this is the one that we want to transform the system so we, there, it started out being called system transformation. Now it's called, it's, they've given it a name called Mana Faikaha. And that's being tested in the Manua 2 with the intention of rolling it out right across the entire nation. Um, and the, it, that is really, really positive because um, it, is a, it is an ultimate commitment by government to um, utilize cross-government departmental funds so different ministries combining money um, to give the person, a to give people a personal budget that they can then use to purchase services if they want. They can purchase uh, services from a host provider like us, or they can do it completely on their own. And um, yeah, it's giving people a lot more options. So I think that in New Zealand, we're really progressing in terms of, uh, the commitment to self-direction, and it is at various stages. I think that one of the most challenging things is that it's in little, the progress is in little geographical pockets in New Zealand, and there's still parts in New Zealand that, that have the old traditional individualized funding approach. Mm. So, um, 
So, Marsha, does this um, give us a little bit more sense of the scope of this in terms of, you've mentioned the numbers, but the variety of people um, whose needs can be met through this approach and the, and, and the current flexibility in how people can use their funds. Okay, so that's still, that's still in my opinion, too limited. Um, that not, probably 99% of people who are using individualized funding in New Zealand are under the under 65s with a disability, right? There's small pockets of um, different funders who are saying this actually works. So we have, we also have 13 DHBs across, sorry, we have 20 DHBs across the country. 13 of them have said, mm, we should try this. It's really working well for that disability population. So we're getting samples of one and two and three, you know, um, so we've aged care is something there. People are going, mm, you know, that people are still, when I say people, funders, the people with the money, um, are still very risk averse around that. They, they have an idea that, that uh, aged care um, is, is, too, is too risky because those people are too frail, which is nonsense, actually. <laughs> um, and there's also um, uh, a little bit going on with our accident, uh, with our ACC, um, which is for it, it, an ins a global, um, sorry, national insurance program for people who have accidents. Um, and that's completely separate from disability. So that they're, they're venturing into it as well. Um, and uh, mental health, people with mental health issues, that's, that's starting with samples of one and two, you know, in, in little areas of New Zealand as well. But there's huge potential there. You know, there's a lot of international evidence that shows that self-direction will work in mental health. So that's certainly an area that we've been uh, looking at. Um, but like I said, the biggest, the biggest group is still the disability group under 65s. We have, Bonamanui has 60% of our people that are under 30. So, you know, it's a lot of young people and a lot of moms and dads and families. Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of the disability population, we, we run about 60% in intellectual disability uh, and the rest physical. Uh, and, and there's all the whole range of, of uh, disability label. In terms of what they can buy, Traditional IF is hours of support and associated overheads. So they're not allowed to, um, they're only allowed to basically hire a support person for their, for help with their activities of daily living and that kind of thing. People get very creative with that though. And, you know, it does enable them to go into the community and like I said, get a job um, because they structure everything themselves and they, and it's all culturally appropriate because it's culturally specific and um and it's and it's fit for purpose because they do it themselves um the, the so that's traditional if uh is just hours of support and associated overheads and that's it um the demonstration projects try to expand out those purchasing guidelines the you know the permission to purchase and uh what they said in the demonstration projects was that it had to uh, meet your goals, right? So people had to actually write a plan and have goals, um, which quite frankly drives people crazy. Um, and they, it had to be defensible. They had to be able to defend it as related to the disability. So they had to say, I, am, I want this particular support or service or thing because it helps me with my disability. So they had to be able to do that. And it couldn't be something that was funded anywhere else in the system. So that one's hard because a lot, most people don't know what's funded where. In, you know, it, that's, a, that's a navigation component that the average person with a disability or even a host provider and lots of people within the system don't understand the system. <laughs> you know, so that, that one is, was tricky. And also the, the thing that's, that is out of you know absolutely not permitted is to purchase or purchase things or contribute to the cost of living so what we mean by that is rent uh transportation your um, power bills your whatever you know individualized funding is specifically 
targeted to disability supports. But the purchasing guidelines for those demonstration projects that I talked about, uh, they just focus, they're much looser now. And in Manapaikaha, if you can defend it as being required for the, for, to support you with your disability and to have a good life in that, with, within that context, then pretty much you can buy it. So it's a, it's a huge leap in terms of pro, um, progress. You know, if you think about on one end, it's hours of support and associated overheads. On the other end, it's just defend it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fantastic um, progress. And, and so, Marsha, so in this context, it might be interesting for people to understand a little bit about what Mano Anui has brought to this because um, <clears throat> having a specific organization to kind of manage the middle in the way that you're doing, as I understand it, is is not normal. I mean, there are some examples of that internationally, but um, I think it's quite, you're in quite a developed and privileged position. So it, I think people will be interested in kind of what the function of Manawanui is, how you imagine that, and, and maybe yeah. some of the um, de developmental challenges you've faced over mm -hmm. the last few years. Do you have three hours? <laughs> um, no, but <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Go for it. I'm going to start by saying Manawanui means perseverance and tenacity. That's what wow. it's a Maori word that means perseverance and tenacity. And we that we come by that quite honestly. I have to say, when you know, it's always had Manawanui's always had that title. But as the years gone on, have gone on, I can happily say that we've earned that title now because um, it has taken perseverance and tenacity um, but our role first of all it started with a co-design process so the Ministry of Health worked with Manu Inui to co-design um, a model that would support people to build their capacity and be successful with implementing self-direction what that looks like we're, we're a host provider um, we're one of nine now in New Zealand, but we are the biggest ones. And, and we, had the pr we had the absolute privilege of being first, right? Because we, it, that has allowed us, the reason I say it's a privilege is it's allowed us to make a lot of mistakes and to learn from those mistakes. So um, what we are as a host provider is sit in the middle with the funder on this end and the person, the disabled person on this end, and we act as a facilitator in the middle for the flow of funds between the funder and the person. The money still sits at the, at the Ministry of Health or the funder, whatever funder we're working with. And what, what that means is the person gets a virtual budget. So they'll, they'll, they'll know that they have, say, $20,000 and it's sitting up at the Ministry of Health. Um, they get a referral to Mana we, we sit down with them. We send a coach out. It's across the nation, nationwide. Send a coach out, and the coach talks to the person about how to do things. And what that entails is um, this is your budget. This is how much you have if you spend it consistently. But you don't have to spend it consistently. You can spend it up and down if you want, as long as you don't, as long as you don't go over that budget. That budget is usually one year in length. So they can spend it however they want over the year. This is how to employ staff. These are your obligations as an employer. And these are the services that we could offer to support you. And what those services are, are the uh, back office, we call them, or business support functions. So we will assist the person to um, recruit uh, the person of their choice. We'll do all that paperwork and set them up essentially as a, as a small business with our tax department. Um, then we, we will do all of their payroll for them if that's what they want, um, or we will pay them and they can pay their staff. So there's two options. Run a, pay, a proper payroll, mano the, per, the person gets their support delivered in their home by the person of their choice. Then we pay the support person and we collect the money back from the government. Right, does that make sense? Um, and then the other option is that the person will pay their support person directly, sorry, the client or the customer will pay their support person directly. Um, send us an expense claim, we pay, we pay the person back, 
the disabled person or the customer, and then we invoice the Ministry of Health. So we're not sitting on people's money. We don't fund hold. We're just a, a conduit for the money between the person and the funder. When I say we're just a conduit, it's a very important role in my view because um, it allows us to help the person build the capacity to manage that. Um, and what I do hear a lot of uh, in, in other areas and other programs in the world is that if you leave somebody, if you say, here's your budget and you leave them to do it, a lot of time they'll flounder because they, they don't know how to do it and they, or they don't have the support and managing tax and employment law and um, all of those things that you are, you have to do by law can be very complicated. So um, it, it is our privilege to sit in the middle and, and assist people to be successful. We try and our, our, our thing is to make it as easy as possible. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff that we've done um, in terms of platforms and, and web portals and recruitment uh, matching websites and that kind of thing to assist people to make it really, really easy. But the idea is that the money comes through Mana to the to the person. And then we help them to manage all their payments and keep track of their budget and not overspend. Um, and if they're underspending, we'll go to them and say, are you okay? You know, is, is there anything wrong here? And that so, Marsha, one of the one of the things in the European experience we've been talking about, drawing, I mean, there have been very many positive developments in Europe, but um, also there's still a long way to go. And so we've been trying to explore why, given that versions of self-directed support began 50 years ago, if you go back to California as possibly the beginning of this, mm -hmm. um, you know, why has it taken 50 years for us to get to a place where, well, we're nowhere near 100%, are we? I mean, we're, we're oh. you know, at best, I think, you know, it's, a, it's 10, 15, 20% kind of, and, and, and still slow progress. So uh, it's interesting, I think, for people to think about uh, what are the factors that slow things down? What are the strategies that you can do to overcome resistance? You talked a little bit about you know, what happens when the civil servants change, for instance. But yes. maybe you yes. could reflect a little bit on, on the battle for change in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, the, the, the perseverance and tenacity that I spoke of um, is fundamentally about that interface uh, between government and, well, for us, it was us as the host provider, but ultimately... It's that interface between the government and the disabled person um, because it's very difficult for governments to, to relinquish control. You know, this is all about power and control. It's about saying, it's about shifting the paradigm and saying that we're, we're shifting the power from the system and the provider and the, and the government departments back to the person. That's a very uncomfortable place for governments to sit, you know, particularly when it's, they have stewardship over public funds, tax money, right? They tax the populace and then they have to protect and account for that. And it's very difficult for them to say, here, Simon, here's $20,000, use it how you want. You know, that, that is an uncomfortable place for them to be. And so it is about, fundamentally, it's about risk aversion, you know, and, and government officials, uh, you know, trying to cover off every possible risk right so there's and when i say that i mean um financial risk but also that whole duty of care idea you know that uh per, we, you know it's the paternalistic approach that that absolutely pervades it, it is infiltrated i don't know I, I don't know an easier word but it's everywhere it's embedded in in health and disability we know best Right, and that we also have to make sure that you're safe. So, how do we know that when you hire somebody, you're going to be safe? How do we know that that person is going to be good for you? You know, um, and and so there's that tension too. There's quality of care and duty of care and financial risk in terms of the interface between. 
governments and policymakers and a, and a disabled person or the person any person who is getting um, uh, self-directed supports. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, that, like you said, the change in um, officials. That's a, because there's always a political agenda, and when governments change, then the agenda changes, and you lose momentum, right? Um, the other really big component here, and I alluded to it earlier, is the idea of capacity building. Is that you? You, you know, the success comes when uh, you know when people are supported to do this, and when they're supported to learn, because it's not. It doesn't come easy. You know, perhaps if you run a, a, a business yourself, and, you know, and you have a disabled child, it would be easier. But not everybody has that competence. You know, and a lot of times these these families or these disabled people are are have never even held jobs, right? So, and and they happen and they're marginalized. So it's very difficult for them to just come up with the skills to do this. You know. The capacity building part is critical, I think, to facilitating success. And that's, that's what I think we've built over the years. You know, and and um, I can say that quite, quite faithfully because when we first started individualized funding, and I have been involved pretty much since the genesis, um, since the start, when we first started, we limited it to people who were stable, um, lower need, uh, had were able to manage a budget, all of those things that so that so that everything could be done at an arm's length. You know that you didn't have to do much for these people. Now we've got a whole we've got four thousand people, and you know people are joining because they're looking at somebody they know with a disability and going, I want what that person has, but they might not have any skills at all uh, in terms of managing that, and. You know, as far as we're concerned, self-direction is a human right. You know, it's everybody should have the right to say how they live their lives and who comes into their home and who sees them naked every day. You know, that's pretty pretty intense stuff. You know, and you, we we think that that's a human right. So even if you don't have the skills, you should be supported to build those skills so that you could be self-directed. That's that's the position. So capacity building needs to be embedded. It needs to be in the system somewhere in order to make it successful, in my opinion. Right? So you need political will. You need friendly officials <laughs> and friendly politicians. You need a good policy background. You need capacity building. Those are all of the things that we, that we had to struggle to, to get. And then the most important thing is, is, is a client base where you get momentum Right. So, so, in the, and these are our customer base, or how, whatever you, however you want to call <laughs> our people. Um, the the stories, you know, when you get some success stories about the transformational effect that self direction has on people's lives, you get attention, and then you get more and more people wanting to do that. You know, when when they see this person that they know, all of a sudden, um, get out of their house. Uh, go to the pub, you know, the, um, go to the bowling club, go to uh, participate in, I uh, get a job, you know, do all of those things. Those are trans, that's a transformational effect that other people say, oh, I, I want that, you know, and then you get a group that has momentum that can't actually be halted, you, you know, if I, it can't be stopped because those same taxpayers, you know, that whose money is being used, they vote, you know, and I think it's, we have every election that, um, that we have, we do a big push to get disabled people to vote because, you know, that makes a big difference. They, we need to, I, I guess that's the other thing is you need to mobilize people as much as possible politically. Um, and by way of example, when, when the men, when the officials were interfering or saying you can do this and you can't do that um, with the enhanced individualized funding, we sent out a template for people to write a letter. You know, said here's here's how to write a letter. Just fill in your 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 stuff. You can add to it. You can do whatever you want. But this is how how it would look. So we made it easy for them to to mobilize. 
We weren't popular for that, by the way. <laughs> but so that, but that's really helpful. So we're talking about, I suppose, the power of really doing it and people's lived experience and how that builds, but also yeah. not being frightened to see this as a political challenge because, right. you know, human rights aren't easily given, are they? They may be real and and established in principle or even in law, but they they have to be more, don't they? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, um, I think the illustration of, you know, those, client, those stories are just all important and, and getting them out there, you know, to, you just have to illustrate, illustrate, illustrate. So, um, this has been really clear and really helpful. So thank you, Marsha. So, I mean, this kind of question is a little bit of a, of a jump because I want you to think about, um, your friends in Europe, people kind of maybe in your kind of role, or maybe also think about families in Europe and uh, people with disabilities in Europe. And um, what kind of strategic advice could you give them? What would you suggest if, if things have not even begun perhaps, or if the people are just beginning the journey towards self-direction, um, what, what should people remember or think about? Mm, that's a complicated question. Um, I, I, well, I think it's about connecting with the disability. Well, whatever community you, you, you're targeting. So it could be aged care, it could be mental health, it could be disability, um, or, you know, or whatever. I think self-direction applies across all demographics. Um, but I would say it would be connecting with that community and talking to them about the benefits of it if you have any illustrations that, you know, to say, this is what it could look like because people don't know what they don't know and they, become, they fall back to the familiar. So they'll, if they're used to working with a traditional provider in a traditional way, then, and, and it feels safe, you know, so it's a, I think it's about connecting with those communities and um, making it safe for them to have a voice, to use their voice and to stand behind them you know, um, not in front, stand behind and, and help them to, to be heard. I think the other thing strategically for us is to make really good, strong relationships with friendly officials and friendly ministers. You know, you, you have to find those people and talk to them and illustrate. And, you know, it's, it's no use. Well, I haven't had any luck so far in... Um, you know, I talked about being unpopular because of the template we sent out. That, that didn't, I mean, all it did <laughs> was fracture those relationships to some extent. I mean, we did get attention and we got, we got some progress in terms of policy development, but it, it's harder to come um, up against a system than to work with it. So particularly a political system. So I, the, the, I think the, the gems that, that we had were a, friendly, a really friendly official, uh, not sorry, a really friendly minister and, and a couple of influential friendly officials in terms of progressing policy. But the other thing is you need to have the momentum of the community that's, that you want to target, you know, that you want to take this up. And, and I don't think that... Uh, you know, I, th I think you need a, a common interest. So, for example, uh, you know, with, uh, with us, a good example is the Australian Every Voice Counts, Every Australian Counts campaign. That was, that's a really good example of getting people behind a, a cause, you know, and, um, yeah, in, in New Zealand, it was about talking to those mums, those squeaky wheels, those challenging people. You know, and saying there is a better way. How how can we make this happen? And then having those conversations with the friendly officials and the friendly minister, and then having stories to say, see, this is what this is what the differences makes. Mm. It sounds a little bit like um, chemistry, Marsha. You're describing there, isn't it? A little, a little bit of 
advocacy, a little bit of um, bringing the right people that you need into the mix together, offering them a bit of a framework for what the positive change might look like. Um, and uh, yeah, just pushing that, that natural chemistry, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, and I think the other thing that's really, if you, if you can, two things. Find the burning platform, you know, find the pain points. And usually for, for a government and a policy, that's money, right? You know, and then the evidence to support that you can fix that pain point. And, and you know, now there's quite a bit of, well, it, it's a growing evidence base um, in terms of the difference that self-direction makes, you know, and um, pre present the evidence and the, and the um, demand from the, from the client group, um, along with, uh, you know, the, the solution. So, and, and so those things together, I think, that, that sell, a, sell something like this. Yes, I think sometimes I talk about the, the bell curve. You actually need to operate at the two extremes of the bell curve. So there are people who, who are kind of desperate for this or doing it already under the radar or, you know, they're your yeah. primary advocates. They're, they know exactly what this is about. But then there's, there's yeah. also the services that need to be shut down and where self-direction yeah. is is the answer, you know, so almost the kind of Absolutely. the really problematic bits of service where if, if, if we don't use self-direction, actually people will just go through decades of converting something terrible into something slightly less terrible. Whereas actually yeah. sometimes you can short circuit that by saying, let's go straight to great. Let's get, get you yeah. out of this institution or let's get you out of this crisis. Um, and, uh, I mean, and, and that that requires, I think, sometimes a different. Um, that you definitely need to address some of those risk issues because that's where lots of people create fear. But I agree with Absolutely. you. Absolutely, um, it's, it's about finding the points where people are willing to change. And and making it easy. Yeah. You know, so ultimately, what you want to do is take away the pain for the funder, like. There's no risk here. We've got systems that manage the risk, um, you know, or we can design systems that manage the risk, um, and we can we can make it cost effective. And there's a lot of evidence for that that it's at worst cost neutral, but at best it's cost effective. And then take away the pain for the person by making for the disabled person or, or aged care or mental health by making it easy to implement for them so that they succeed. You know. Yeah. So, Mar Marsha, do you have, so you, I think you've done a great job of, of really giving us a sense of the journey that New Zealand's been on. And, and uh, so just do you have any last thoughts, really, that you just want to share? Um, could be anything. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, the whole human rights issue is something that we can't lose as a, as a movement and that self-determination, self-direction, underpins citizenship <laughs> that people cannot be a citizen unless they're self-directed unless they have choice and power and those those things entail um you know control over money it, you, you can't so much of the time i get what i'm trying to get to is authenticity here right so much of the time a system will say, yes, we give you choice, control, and flexibility, and it's self-directed because you get to say whether you go to the movies or skating or to the beach. But, you know, instead of saying, actually, how do you want your life to look? And here is the money you have. It's, it, that's a critical point. Um, you know, unless somebody knows and has control over that, they're not self-directed. You know, and, and there's so many... I have seen so many providers who will say, who will use the rhetoric, but not use the reality. And the reality is, give the power back. Give, you know, and the power is about choice and money and control. You know, all of those, all of those concepts, uh, Simon, that contribute to people being true citizens. So I guess my, my last thoughts are we need to be authentic about this. We need to be brave and, um, 
and 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 shift to power and 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 absolutely um, commit to giving it back in an authentic way. Well, Marcia, thank you very much. That was really helpful. I'm sure lots of people get a lot out of that. I'm going to stop recording oh. now. <laughs>